So hello everyone again, and thank you for attending today's presentation on the intersection of health disparities populations, tobacco use, and COVID-19. My name is Jim Pavlik, and I'm the Senior Program and Policy Analyst at the Behavioral Health and Wellness Program at the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus. I began my career in public health as a communications specialist, health communicator, and educator. I moved briefly to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services in a small branch under the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response. Since 2013, I've been at BHWP, where among other things, I provide technical assistance to local and state public health departments in the domain of tobacco cessation and organizational policy. And with me today is BHWP's director and a professor here in the Department of Psychiatry, Dr. Chad Morris. And he'll be offering uh, some advice uh, for clinicians and educators working in this space, as well as uh, walking us through the uh, health disparities populations of interest today. Our goal today is threefold. We want to uh, explore the disproportionate impact COVID-19 and infectious, infectious diseases have among tobacco users from health disparity populations. Review the scientific evidence base regarding tobacco's role in suppressing the immune system, damaging the lungs, and causing the underlying medical conditions that are associated with worse COVID-19 outcomes. And we want to discuss potential actions to promote education and abstinence from tobacco, particularly for at-risk populations. And finally, before getting started, I do want to let everyone know that we have no conflicts of interest, financial or otherwise, to disclose. Our goal today is to share some facts from the scientific literature to help understand what is happening. That being said, SARS-CoV-2 and COVID are brand new and very little is still known. You can search the medical literature on its predecessor, SARS-CoV-1, and see that that is still a developing body of work and it emerged over 15 years ago. We're gonna be learning and writing about SARS-CoV-2 for years. In this first section, I want to establish two things. And the first is, why are we talking about this today and why did BHBP decide to insert itself into the conversation? And the same, second thing I want to do is to establish um, what, are the, what are the salient features of this virus that set the groundwork for our concerns for the, the group of people that we selected to talk about today? And the answer to the first part is simple. People are already talking about the risk of smoking and other habits as they relate to COVID. And many of you attending today are prob probably thinking about it for personal reasons or because you're caring for patients or clients or maybe even family members who smoke and you wanna know if there are additional risks due to their tobacco use and if there are any immediate benefits to quitting and you're probably looking for things to say to them when they ask you questions about these and other cessation related topics. Since so many of the commenters pictured here our MDs or other experts, the question remains, what can we add that you didn't see here if you've read these already? Well, this is a different venue. This isn't an op-ed or a blog that you can read in two minutes. We want to provide you the data. We want to provide you some access uh, to the uh, a, a deeper view into the scientific literature so that you can arm yourself with a better understanding of what is actually known so that you can translate this information for your clients. We also have begun this process of fine-tuning messaging uh, that is a little bit more uh, empathetic. So with all that out of the way, let's get started. The first thing I want to do is distinguish between SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. Although I, I think the last three months has probably helped most of you to know the difference, I still see the two being incorrectly referred to in some of the reporting, so it's worth being clear. SARS-CoV-2 is the virus and it's short for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. The 2 is used to distinguish it from its cousin, SARS-CoV-1, which was responsible for the disease SARS, which had a brief but terrifying moment in the sun back in 2002 and 2003. At the end of its epidemic, it had caused 8,422 known cases, of which 916 died, a case fatality rate of about 11%. The virus of concern now, SARS-CoV-2, causes the disease COVID-19. COVID, in this case, is short for coronavirus disease, and the 19 is the year in which it was first identified, December 2019 in China. SARS-CoV-2 is sometimes referred to as the COVID-19 virus. COVID-19 is a respiratory infection characterized by some combination of flu-like symptoms, the most common of which are a fever and or dry cough. Other respiratory symptoms like a runny nose do occur with varying degrees of frequency, and although fever and dry cough are common, not everyone who tests positive for the virus has reported these symptoms. 
SARS-CoV-2 is a coronavirus, so-called because under an electron microscope, they have little nodules that make it look like a crown or a corona in Latin. Coronaviruses are responsible for an estimated 15 to 30 percent of seasonal colds, that is minor upper respiratory infections, although in rare cases even those coronaviruses can move to the lower respiratory system. But they are most famously responsible for the SARS epidemic I already mentioned and the MERS outbreak of 2012 to 2013, and several more since then. Like SARS, MERS had an extremely high case fatality rate. According to the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control, from March 2012 to December 2019, there had been, across all known outbreaks, 2,494 cases of which 912 had died, an astounding case fatality rate of 36.6%. COVID was first reported on December 31st, 2019 in China. All the initial cases were reported to occur in individuals that had visited a local wet market, a market where animals are both sold and butchered on site. However, by January 7th, it was confirmed that human-to-human -human transmission was occurring. The first cases outside of China were uh, both in January in Thailand and in Japan. The first U.S. case presented in Sonomish County, Washington on January 19th. On March 17th, West Virginia became the 50th state to report a, a case of COVID. While initial policy responses had been designed to keep the virus out, it became obvious fairly quickly that the virus had gotten loose in communities. The virus has a lag of about five to six days between when an infected individual becomes contagious and the onset of obvious symptoms. The lag can be longer, as long as 14 days, and at least in one case, 27. And this leads to what is called stealth spread. That is, the disease is spreading within a community long before the first case is identified. As a result, when counties and states began taking containment measures, uh, first asking for people to stay in their homes and then later taking more drastic steps like closing public spaces and restaurants and setting rules that employers must obey, it was acknowledged that cases and deaths would continue to rise even if everyone were fully compliant. Of course, not only are people not fully compliant, there are legal exceptions to these stay-at-home, shelter-in-place directives, and there are, there are individuals who by their very nature are differently subject to the laws and differently vulnerable to the virus. First, among these categories are employees deemed essential. And while this designation includes salaried frontline workers like medical providers and other hospital staff, our population of concern today are those minimum wage employees working in grocery stores, as delivery drivers, in food preparation, and other lines of service. We also want to talk about individuals in congregate or group environments with a special focus on incarcerated individuals. And individuals living in or at risk for homelessness and the behavioral health population to which we want to give extra attention. All of these individuals are more likely to have lower health literacy, less access to care, be of a marginalized racial or ethnic minority, and to be smokers. We'll talk about these groups and their unique risks near the end of today's presentation. Right now, I wanna to turn to what we've seen so far out of China. There have been a few dozen reports coming out of China and two different research teams have looked at these studies and decided that about a handful of them reach a level of scientific rigorousness to include, and in one case, a systematic review, and in the other, a meta-analysis. I want to briefly look at what they have found. Vardavas and Nikitara, apologies if I butchered those names, narrowed 71 studies down to five they thought worthy of inclusion. In the first, researchers found that 9% of those that died were smokers, while only 4% of those that survived were. This points to a higher risk of mortality for smoking. Seemingly corroborating the study, a second study found a higher percentage of smokers in the group that progressed to a more severe form of the disease compared to those that improved or stabilized. Confusingly, and often left out of the op-eds I pictured earlier, is this third study, which found that a much, much greater percentage of individuals who are eventually in need of intensive care were non-smokers, while no, smoker, no smokers were found in the ICU group. It's worth noting that while this study, Huang et al., captured one of the larger differences between groups, it is also the smallest sample uh, of the five studies. The fourth uh, and fifth studies in this particular systematic review both showed a return to form, with both smokers and former smokers showing greater progression to a more severe form of the illness. From these five studies, the authors conclude, quote, although further research is warranted as the weight of the evidence increases with the limited data available, smoking is most likely associated with the negative progression and adverse outcomes of COVID-19. In contrast, Lippi and Henry, writing at a slightly later date, also captured five out of 27 studies that matched their search criteria. Four of these five were also used in the previous systematic review. 
they did not include Rizzo at all. And you can see that particular study now stricken out on this table at the very top there in gray. But they added Yang at all. Yang, like Huang, had a counterintuitive finding. Among those who survived, 10% were smokers. No smokers at all were found among those that died. Worth noting again, this is our second smallest sample size. In their meta-analysis, Lippi and Henry conclude, quote, the results of this preliminary meta-analysis based on Chinese patients suggest that active smoking does not apparently seem to be significantly associated with enhanced risk of progressing towards severe disease in COVID-19. That is almost a verbatim reversal of the first paper's conclusion. Writing at a somewhat later date, Berlin et al. was able to look at both, both of these studies, and for reasons we will explain in the upcoming sections of this webinar, BHWP has to agree with their conclusions, which are at the bottom of this slide, quote, the nicotine and tobacco research and healthcare community, to which BHWP would add public health as well, cannot ignore these signals, however mixed and disputed they may be right now. Berlin et al. note that among the reasons that we share worries with other public health officials, professors, and providers are those that appear here, namely that we have seen tobacco play a role in increasing risk with other infections and in respiratory infections in particular. But simply insisting that there must be a connection isn't enough. With that in mind, can we learn anything by looking at the role of tobacco use with other coronaviruses? I've chosen three studies uh, to recap in regard to, to MERS. Two of them are from the 2014 outbreak of uh, MERS in Saudi Arabia and one from the 2015 outbreak in South Korea. The two studies on the Saudi Arabian outbreak use different methodologies, which can help provide us some comfort that the findings there are robust. The inclusion of the South Korean case can help assure us that there is a level of generalizability since they share similar findings despite different demographics. In short, all three studies found the odds of death among, speakers was, uh, among smokers was much higher than with uh, never smokers. About a quarter of non-smokers died from the disease, which is still pretty high, but about three quarters of smokers did. It's also worth looking at SARS, even though the findings here are less definitive. It's worth looking at SARS because SARS-CoV-1, as its name implies, is much more closely to, uh, related to the COVID virus. One of its many similarities is the use of the ACE2 receptor, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Something that was interesting with SARS was that a lot of the, case, a lot of the uh, cases were among female hospital workers. And as such, many of those that were infected were non-smokers. As a result, at first glance, it appeared that not smoking raised one's chances of getting the disease. And in fact, public health in China did have to ask people not to try the quote unquote smoking cure. The smoking cure was shown to be false in a study about a year after the outbreak. There was also a study looking at the relationship between air pollution and SARS, and that study found a possible and plausible connection between increased air pollution and increased incidence and severity of SARS. This is what we would expect to find if lung damage either increased susceptibility and or diminished the body's ability to withstand the, the uh, disease's attack. And this may at first seem tangential, but a recent study linking air pollution and increased risk of mortality from COVID is currently in pre-press as we speak. Basically, chronic exposure to toxins and particulate matter damages the lungs, causes an inflammatory response, and is directly linked to many of the comorbidities associated with COVID. The question we wanna to turn to now is, what are the potential ways tobacco may aggravate the disease? This is important because if the causal pathways to harm are the same with smoking and COVID as it is with smoking and other infections, then we might better understand whether one, cessation can improve outcomes, two, whether other drugs of, uh, drug uses of a concern, and three, whether those who use vaping devices, uh, AKA electronic nicotine delivery systems or ENDS, I'll be using that phrase going forward, are also exposing themselves to greater risk. It is most common to think about tobacco use in its role uh, in, uh, in the incidence development and mortality related to various chronic diseases that develop over years of regular exposure. In 2005, the CDC estimated that smoking was responsible for 123,836 lung cancer deaths per year from 1997 to 2001, and another 90,582 annual deaths were due to COPD caused by smoking. However, we should not overlook that over that same time period, nearly 11,000 annual deaths were caused by pneumonia and influenza, including an average of about 150 pediatric deaths each year over the past four years. 
That's 2016 to 2020. Because influenza is a viral respiratory infection like COVID, perhaps how tobacco use interacts with the flu can prove a helpful comparison. As we near the end of the 2019 to 2020 flu season, we should note that in terms of our hospitalization rate, it was pretty bad. The CDC currently is projecting that as of April 4th, we have had roughly 575,000 hospitalizations, a rate of 67.9 per 100,000, making it the second worst in the past 10 years. The rates among children zero to four and adults ages 18 to 49 are the highest on record for those groups. 92% of individuals hospitalized with the flu had an underlying condition uh, in which tobacco use is implicated. The 2019 to 2020 flu season has killed 166 children and caused a projected 43,000 deaths overall. We assume from previous studies that about a quarter of these deaths were caused by tobacco use. None of this is to invite an equivalence with the COVID pandemic. So I know that this can seem like a distraction from that topic. I'm bringing this up for two reasons. The first is to simply uh, emphasize that the COVID pandemic is a reminder that tobacco use it always plays an important role in making our communities less resilient to viral infections. The other is to emphasize that, emphasize that this association between tobacco smoke and influenza is confirmed to be causal. The explanatory mechanisms that have been proposed in regard to influenza may help explain why some have observed a possible connection to tobacco use and increased risk in regard to COVID. In terms of the role that tobacco use may play in directly impacting if a person contracts the coronavirus and to what extent that disease progresses to a critical stage, there are two things to think about. The impact of tobacco use on the immune system and the way that the toxins in the smoke damage and otherwise impact the respiratory system itself, perhaps decreasing its ability to withstand the insult the virus delivers. One thing that has been known for a while is that tobacco use is associated with increased risk for developing several infectious diseases, including, including pneumococcal pneumonia, Legionnaire's disease, and the common cold. Why this is the case is not perfectly understood. Nearly 50 years ago, researchers, re researchers determined that smokers have elevated levels in all major blood cell types, including the immunity-related white blood cells. But what this may mean in terms of disease susceptibility has not been determined. But the main takeaway is that smokers seem to suffer from a suppressed immune system related to, among other things, both less responsive and less motile white blood cells. Some of these factors, like motility, do not seem attributable to nicotine, but others, like the elevated counts, may be. Nicotine is known to have both a stimulatory and suppressive effect on the immune system. The 2014 Surgeon General report, The Health Consequences of Smoking, summarizes, quote, Nicotine suppresses the production of antibodies, reduces the proliferation of T-cells, and attenuates T-cell signaling, uh, which have been linked to the impaired host defense response to viruses in nicotine-treated animals. Nicotine's role here is worth noting because if nicotine, independent of smoking, is a thing to be worried about, then ENDS users, vapors, may also be vulnerable to infections as well. And I don't want to say that conclusively because there are variable effects on the immune system given differing characteristics of the nicotine itself. Snus, for example, does not replicate the effects of smoking. The nicotine patch also does not seem to have this negative impact on the immune system either. It is unknown if the freebase nicotine in first through third generation e-cigs or the nicotine salts found in Juul and other pod mods is problematic. And even if it is, it would remain the case that someone moving from, ends, uh, from smoking to ends uh, may still remove some harm done by the exposure to carcinogens and other toxins found in the smoke. Separate from its uh, effects on the immune system are the many ways that at least smoking and perhaps vaping can injure the respiratory system itself, making it less capable of withstanding an infection and perhaps making the body's response to an infection more fatal. For example, one thing to note is that uh, the damage is delivered through multiple mechanisms. Oxidative injury it, uh, itself, while listed as a single mechanism of injury, is illustrative. Not only does smoke introduce free radicals into the lungs, the toxins in the smoke also cause expressions of genes that regulate oxidative damage, therefore both causing the damage and also impeding the body's ability to repair that damage. We also note that the toxins in smoke induce an inflammatory response that is itself damaging, while also impeding repair. Separate from this conversation, we should note that smoking causes a systemic inflammatory response that in some ways mimics the effects of chronic stress. Chronic stress through various mechanisms reduces the effectiveness of our res immune response. This can be critical if we understand that death related to respiratory diseases is often related to the body overreacting to the viral invasion. 
when the immune system is too uh, response, when the immune response is too great, the lungs, as just one example, will fill with mucus or sputum at, sputum at levels beyond which it can clear. An under-responsive immune system may be precisely one that is unable to gauge the proper intensity of the response required. And then, as we see in the second bullet point, other chemicals in the smoke, in this case, acrolyne and formaldehyde, can independently damage the, the body's ability to clear those airways. Both acrolyne and formaldehyde have been found in some ENDS products, but this seems to be dependent on the flavored liquid that is used, so amounts tend to vary. And I wouldn't exaggerate the potential for risk here. In both cases, those toxins are found in lower levels than are found in traditional tobacco products and may not be found at all. And while total abstinence from nicotine products is the safest option for many already addicted to nicotine and living through one of the most stressful moments in probably 100 years, abstinence might not be a realistic option. I wouldn't want to discourage what may very well be a legitimate step toward abstinence with a potential harm reduction benefit along the way. Initially, I wasn't uh, going to include anything on the ACE2 receptor today, but then the Lippy and Henry meta-analysis came out and in it they hypothesized that the reason they may not have found an association between COVID and progression, or uh, between, I'm sorry, COVID progression and smoking is because, quote, smoking downregulates ACE2. But this is a disputed point. ACE2 was only discovered 20 years ago, so the research here is limited and new. ACE2 is a protein on the surface of cells that both SARS-CoV-1 and 2 bind to. SARS-CoV-2 is a tighter fit if we're using the lock and key metaphor that normally governs these conversations. This could be at least part of the reason that SARS-CoV-2 seems to be more contagious than its cousin. There seems to be some evidence that tobacco use causes some cells to be more responsive to ACE2 binding while causing other cells to be less responsive to it. It's possible that because SARS-CoV-2 can infect cells in the upper and lower respiratory systems, that there might be countervailing forces at work. For example, it's possible that smoking does not increase susceptibility, but does create more severe cases in those that are infected, specifically due to the different effects on ACE2 in these two possible infection sites. In our final exploration of how tobacco use may cause individuals to be more susceptible to the disease in general, and why if they get it, they are more likely to have worse outcomes, we turn our attention to comorbidities seen to increase the chances of those worse outcomes. In March, the US CDC updated its list of risk factors for severe COVID. Um, it was evident early on that older individuals uh, uh, were at high risk for uh, severe illness. Added to that list in March were individuals with specific underlying medical conditions pictured here. According to the 2014 Surgeon General's report, there is sufficient evidence to conclude that smoking causes chronic lung disease and asthma, coronary heart disease and, and other heart-related conditions, that uh, it suppresses the immune system, uh, and it causes diabetes. It also contributes to the development of kidney cancer, and by causing, causing diabetes, contributes to the development of kidney failure as well. It also contributes to the progression of liver disease, from liver disease to liver cancer. As we've already pointed out, but it bears repeating, the CDC further explains under immunocompromised that, quote, many conditions can cause a person to be immunocom immunocompromised, including cancer treatments, smoking, bone marrow or organ transplantation, immune deficiencies, poorly controlled HIV or AIDS, and prolonged use of corticosteroids and other immune weakening medications. Given at least that previous slide, I think it's clear that smoking must be a risk factor for worse COVID outcomes since smoking causes comorbidities which have been seen to worsen outcomes. But if we are forced to stick with the science in its current state, I think we have to consider at least five limitations that we don't have good studies to overcome. The first is just to reiterate that all we have so far are observational studies and we'll need more research to get to causality for COVID. The second area of uncertainty is whether quitting now offers any additional protection from the currently circulating virus. There are some reason to believe that it might. In some studies, tissue damage begins to repair itself shortly after cessation. We've also seen white blood cell counts return to normal pretty rapidly. We know that quitting improves pulmonary function by 5% in just a few months after cessation. One of the studies on MERS cited previously did find that more ex-smokers were in the survivor group and not the deceased group. While it is not yet certain that former smokers reduced their susceptibility to SARS-CoV-2, it is worth noting that with influenza, pneumonia, and tuberculosis, former smokers reduced their risk substantially. According to the Surgeon General's most recent 2019 report on cessation, men who smoke ages 55 to 64 uh, have a relative risk of contracting these diseases 15 times higher than never smoking men of the same age. By contrast, 
former smokers' relative risk is less than a third as high, only 3.98. Women's relative risk drops from 9 to 1.85. Now, having a, a, a two or four times greater risk than never smokers is still a pretty heavy tax to pay for a smoking habit. However, as we've already pointed out, it bears repeating that, uh, I'm sorry, as we are uh, reducing your risk by 74, 74 to 80% is a good reason to quit. So while from a purely scientific perspective, perspective, we don't know if quitting will help improve a tobacco user's odds against COVID, as Dr. Stanton Glantz put it in a recent interview, it might not offer any protection, but what do you stand to gain by not quitting? All things being e held equal, and from a purely biological perspective, he's certainly correct. The third area of uncertainty is susceptibility in general. I've been saying that it stands to reason that smoking would create additional susceptibility. And in fact, many have observed that in America, more young people than in, in, in other countries are getting diagnosed. And one hypothesis here is that it's because of our vaping epidemic. One thing we lack in general is a randomized survey of the population to know how many people have been infected. What we have are known cases, and these show disproportionately higher levels of smokers, but that's what we would expect to see even if susceptibility were the same regardless of smoking status, since we think we know that the disease is more likely to progress in smokers once contracted. A fourth area is whether vaping increases either susceptibility, I'm sorry, a fourth area is whether vaping increases either susceptibility, as mentioned earlier, or if it has an impact on the disease's severity. We do have some animal studies that show suppression of the immune system in mice, and that this suppression looks similar to the suppression of the immune system confirmed to happen uh, in humans. One final note before moving on to the next section. I want to pause and briefly mention that while this presentation is focused on the interaction between COVID-19 and tobacco use, that is vaping and smoking, it's possible people who use other substances may also be at increased risk. A particular concern here is marijuana, which like nicotine is most commonly smoked or vaporized, methamphetamine, which is also commonly smoked, and opium and its derivatives, which can not only be smoked, but also have more direct effects on the respiratory system, uh, all of which may ca be cause for additional concern. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Morris. Chad? Great. Thanks, Jim, um, for I mean, synthesizing a, a lot of information in a very short amount of time. Um, and as, as Jim spoke to, there are, there's a lot of vulnerable populations right now, and we're only going to highlight uh, a few. And uh, you can go to the next slide there, Jim. Uh, and these populations are far more likely to be smokers or, or former smokers. Um, often two to four times the prevalence rate of smoking compared to the general population. And during this pandemic, these individuals are faced, facing enormous stressors and uh, also at the same time reduce supportive social networks and have significantly more exposure to infectious disease as uh, Jim was des describing. So at the start of the presentation today, uh, Jim mentioned the populations of focus for this webinar and there are essential low income workers, uh, very many of which have unfortunately already lost their jobs or have been furloughed. Um, if there are those living in institutional or congregate settings such as jails, prisons, nursing homes, long care residential settings, inpatient units. In addition, we wanna touch on persons with mental illnesses and substance abuse disorders uh, as well. Many of these individuals represent more than one of these populations, and that's gonna essentially put them at multiplicative risk. Uh, at the same time, we're, we're focused on these populations. There are a great many other populations that smoke at high rates and overlap with some of, uh, of the demographics of the groups we're gonna focus on, and they definitely warrant additional attention but aren't covered today. Um, that's so populations such as the African American communities, uh, rural and frontier areas, immigrant and refugee communities, our active military, and we could go on and on, uh, but we just had to, to choose uh, certain focuses for today. Uh, next slide. So our first group and focus of interest are essential workers. So these are our minimum wage employees. They're working in grocery stores as delivery drivers and food preparation and other lines of service. Uh, just I'm thinking of this weekend, it's someone like 
the, our driver that delivered my family's food uh, that is more exposed to this virus. Their employment and their living situation doesn't allow for a safe degree of social isolation. They're also potentially more susceptible to infection due to their higher tobacco use. And as they get the disease, they're more likely to continue working while contagious and less likely to seek care early. Uh, and this might be due to the general lack of access to care. It might be fear of not being able to pay for that care. It's also because they, they fear that if they're hospitalized, they're gonna be unable to work or care for their families. And in part, because of their tobacco use, they're more likely to be admitted uh, to hospitals, they're more likely to be hospitalized longer, and more likely to die, unfortunately, uh, from the, the disease itself. Next slide. So our next group of focus are people in congregate living set settings. So again, uh, this can include nursing homes, residential care, group homes, inpatient psych units, um, or any other crowded conditions, uh, crowded uh, treatment conditions. So because of those crowded conditions, they're at extreme risk for contracting um, the disease. And uh, because they often lack the basic amenities or medical equipment to maintain preventative hygiene or social distancing, so I'm, I'm sure a lot of you have been reading these articles, but the New York Times recently identified almost 4,000 cases of the coronavirus associated with nursing homes or long-term care facilities across the nation. And this is in, in many thousands of settings that they have identified so far. Many individuals in congregate settings may have cognitive issues as well that make it really difficult for them to abide by new standards such as social distancing standards and they just might not be understanding these things. And increasingly there may be staff shortages as staff, you know, they, they might become sick themselves or they're choosing not to go to work due to the clear and, and present dangers involved. And while providers are increasingly trying to provide telehealth services and, and other variants in these varied settings, uh, individuals may not have computers, smartphones, or uh, often they don't have the privacy required to do these sessions effectively. Next slide. And then our last group we were looking at uh, and focused on today were persons with mental illnesses and addictions. And uh, social support is, is crucial to, to many people's recovery in this group. Uh, this social support can come in the form of face-to-face -face meetings, peer support groups, 12-step groups, or any other social uh, sources of social connection. And social isolation is a risk factor for worsening symptoms and relapse to alcohol or drug use. Uh, virtual meetings may be useful for those with access to the internet, but again, some do not have that, that capacity. And these individuals uh, very commonly are already coping with toxic stress, PTSD, and now may have to also endure heightened stigma and the implicit bias among uh, many providers regarding their ability to benefit by treatment at this time. So, you know, clinicians are really in the spot where they need to monitor for signs of worsening psychiatric symptoms and uh, more substance use disorders in their patients, given the unprecedented stress, fears, and even grief they may be facing. Um, right now, more than 10 million misuse opioids in the U.S., and these individuals may be at increased risk for the most uh, adverse consequences of COVID-19. Chronic respiratory disease suffered by many individuals who smoke and use other drugs increases risk for contracting the virus, but also the risk of fatal overdose to those using replacement opioid medic medications like methadone or buprenorphine. So social distancing will increase the likelihood of opioid overdoses as well, because uh, there's no one present to administer uh, naloxone or Narcan. Um, so that's a, a concern as well. And so let's go to our, our next slide with the, when we're looking at incarcerated individuals. Um, there are high rates of infections in many correctional sites. For instance, uh, just recently, according to the Legal Aid Society in, in New York City, there are 167 cases of COVID-19 in Rikers alone. So that's an infection rate of 3.6%. So to, to 
compare that in New York City, they have an infection rate right now of less than half of a percent. And the current crisis has brought out some positive steps in some regards by some states or municipalities who have moved to uh, really moving people out of jails and prisons, uh, meaning they have released at-risk prisoners, elderly prisoners, people are uh, close to parole, and reducing the jail and prison population so that the disease doesn't have the, the opportunity to spread as quickly. Unfortunately, there's just not a large number of that happening. Uh, but the enormous problem is really exemplified by uh, articles and a podcast from the Washington State Reformatory in Monroe, Washington, uh, where you know, the inmates were speaking to the basic lack of supplies like masks and hand sanitizer and soap. And when guards and inmates contract the virus, inmates are then put into quarantine lockdown. So they're locked up in these cells for weeks at a time. We're talking about six by nine foot cells, often with two inmates in each cell. And this isolation has very critical effects on people's mental health. Um, bottom line is social distancing is not possible in a lot of these locations. Uh, prisons may be overcrowded as inmates typically held in jails or moved to prisons. Um, when out of their cells, inmates are in very close proximity. They have to line up, they have to eat very closely together. When they are let out in the yard, they, they're typically in very close proximity. And this population has a very high rate of chronic illness to start with. And much of this is due to extremely high rates of smoking or past smoking. And that puts this population at extremely high risk of, of COVID-19. Next slide. And so also looking at the homeless population, um, are those at risk for homelessness even? You can't shelter in place if you don't have a shelter. I mean, this population has extraordinarily high susceptibility to symptomatic infection, hospitalization, and fatality. Uh, not only due to their, to their advanced age, I mean, this is, an, this is an aging population we're talking about, but also the accelerated physical decline and, and mental health problems associated with being homeless. As a salient example, existing studies of homeless populations have observed uh, obstructive pulmonary disease prevalence between 20 to 30 percent compared to about a 10 percent uh, rate for the general adult population. And there's less services sites open right now, and many of these individuals might even avoid those limited service sites because of, the, of fear of catching the, the virus. Um, there's, again, little access like the criminal justice system, little access to hand washing and sanita sanita uh, sanitation, and the inability to practice social distancing in crowded shelters and encampments. And so with, and with the closure of public buildings and restaurants, there's all much less safe places for warmth, rest, recharge uh, during a rapidly changing spring weather, like in Colorado today where it's snowing right now. So, and service agencies are trying to arrange private motel rooms and trying to help isolate individuals, uh, but there's just a, a, a lack of, of the number of these uh, motels, hotels that, that they're able to secure right now. So this crisis is also exacerbated by transportation issues, which is always an issue with the homeless, but it's you know, getting worse. So one idea on the positive with the homeless is this idea of rapidly adopting an SMS or mobile alert system that would allow a broad spectrum of emergency outreach activities with relatively simple technologies. We know that the majority of uh, persons who are homeless have cell phones and the vast majority make use of text messaging. So that does make it possible to put an alert system in place to remind people of new emergency opportunities as they come on stream and really allow people to link to location-based maps or of the nearest locations that they can go to. Next slide. And across all these populations we're talking about, um, and for people who smoke or vape, there is common suppressed immune system. Uh, Jim's mentioned this, so just reinforcing some of this. The damage to the lungs, routine hand to mouth behaviors that can more rapidly spread the virus. People are making additional trips to stores to buy products, decreasing social distancing, 
And there's that shared behavior uh, that is hard to break of gathering together the smoke. And as mentioned previously, the risk of relapse, the substance use to cope with stress, anxiety, depression is very real right now. Next slide. So clearly we have a lot of concerns about those we serve and what we can do. So, and so much seems out of control. So let, let's move into some, some ways that we can move forward. And one of the best ways of helping our clients, patients, families, and communities is first of all, to keep ourselves help, healthy. Uh, this is akin to, if you're on an airplane, the guidance of putting on your own oxygen mask before helping others. And so in the next slides, we're gonna discuss this parallel process of self-care and also attending to others' needs. And, and really, some of these strategies and resources are most appropriate for providers of all kinds. But we're gonna to try to offer recommendations that you can also utilize with your clients and patients. And not all will be perfect, a perfect fit for all of these populations. For instance, decreasing isolation is hard or impossible um, for someone on lockdown in a prison. But you know, we have resources uh, for providers that have, uh, have uh, applicability also to those you're serving. So the Behavioral Health and Wellness Program has created a number of toolkits and resources. And the Work and Wellbeing Guides for physici Physicians and Addiction Professionals are a case in point. And you can download these and share them with whomever you'd like to. Almost all of the tools and recommendations are generalizable across healthcare, public health providers, and, and beyond. It could be teachers, et cetera. And whether you have a few minutes or an hour in your day, there are resources for you in these, in these um, toolkits. Many of the whole health, motivational, um, mindfulness, and values exercises would be very applicable to students, clients, and patients. Next slide. So in looking at some wellness tips, wellness tip number one for you and for also those you're serving is to just cut yourself some slack. You might have moments of high anxiety, uh, not be particularly productive, binge a bit too much on all those snacks that you're stockpiling as part of your COVID pantry, watch a lot of bad TV series, or you know that might just be me, but I'm, I'm guessing it's not. Um, if you aren't having any of these days, you're in a really small minority. And this may also include increased vaping and smoking tobacco or marijuana or more use of other substances to cope. To balance some of these responses to stress, boredom, isolation, general wellness tips include first just checking in with yourself, assessing daily how am I feeling in my body and what are my thoughts and stress level right now. And then we're going to discuss in the next slide based on that assessment, how you can begin to develop coping skills based on that self-assessment. Many people are emphasizing that social distancing does not equate with isolation, rightly so. Social connection, no matter the form, is integral to health. Um, speaking to one group, this is particularly important for older adults who are, are you know, of course very impacted by COVID-19. They're at great risk for early death, dementia, heart disease, when they're socially isolated. It's important that psychologists, family, and friends really make the effort to maintain connections with them, especially those in nursing homes and assisted living facilities. And we know there's some issues with that right now. So generally you can identify healthy coping skills like walk, taking walks, reaching out to friends and family, preparing healthy foods, and also getting off those screens when possible and distracting yourself. Uh, the same news will still be there later that day or even the next day. Next slide. So let's talk about identifying coping strategies. There's three main types of coping. Uh, the first is problem-focused coping skills. These strategies are directed at changing the stressful situation. There's emotion-focused, which is focused on changing, um, focused on changing the situation, not focused on changing the situation. Rather, these strategies are directed at changing the way a person thinks or feels about the stressful situation. And the third is meaning-focused strategies. So these strategies are directed at using the situation to create meaning or understanding of self. Um, so problem-focused strategies are directed at changing the stressful situation. So that can be things like reaching out to your healthcare provider um, or your peers for help. 
emotion focused strategies moving into that are directed at changing the way a person thinks or feels about the stressful situation instead of focused on changing the situation itself. So that can include social su support, sharing your feelings, positive reframing, engaging in self um, care activities. Um, and then the last meaning focused strategies are directed at using the, that stressful situation to create meaning or understanding of self. Examples of meaning focused strategies include contemplation, uh, creative activity, activities, journaling, or just reevaluating your personal beliefs and values. Next slide. One type of coping strategy is not better than another. It really is a goodness of fit um, based on the characteristics of the specific situation. Uh, generally, problem focused strategies work best with controllable aspects of a stressful situation, while emotional or emotion or meaning focused strategies work best with uncontrollable aspects. Um, so as much as we're all feeling pretty out of control right now, it's important to use those emotion and meaning focused interventions, especially for people who lead, tend to lead with problem solving in action. And what we're gonna do is put a worksheet on this, on our landing page where this, we where this webinar will be archived as well, um, so that you will have access to this and other activities. Next. Bottom line is, you are not alone as a provider and individuals you serve are not alone either. Outside of the wellness tips, there's a number of resources for clients and patients. Organizations, including local health agencies and health systems, can consider posting messaging prominently on their websites that factually but compassionately address the smoking and COVID link so the information is readily accessible to your visitors. Next slide. Uh, and one of the ways we can do this also is promoting the state quit lines and other treatment resources that offer free help, making it clear that resources like the quit line are there regardless of your readiness to quit. So you can use a message such as, if you're experiencing increased depression and anxiety, you're not alone. We encourage you to reach out to your healthcare providers through telehealth options and quit lines also provide an opportunity to replace smoking and vaping with healthy coping skills. Next. Telehealth also has exploded. We know that. Everyone on this call knows that. But it presents an immense opportunity to also address smoking. And from the evidence base we have so far, we can, through telemedicine, produce quit rates similar to in-person groups. Many of the barriers are now removed, uh, and there looks to be growing ability to bill for cessation services and people are, you know, different groups are starting to do that right now. Uh, for patients calling their providers or triage call centers for medical advice related to COVID, it's a time to reinforce that screening for tobacco use should be standardized and treatment should be included in care plans for asymptomatic or non-urgent cases. And the University of, of, of California, San Francisco has a really nice triage tool that is an assessment tool for COVID that also addresses tobacco. And so we're gonna put that on that landing page as well so that you have access to that. Um, and then also, if you're not already signed up, consider joining the National Behavioral Health Network today. So this is one of eight networks to eliminate cancer and tobacco disparities in priority populations. NBHN offers a range of training opportunities and it's continuous, continuously updating evidence-based resources. Next slide. And there are a number of other really high quality resources out there. And I'm, I'm just putting some of the, what I consider and uh, what is I think commonly considered some of the highest uh, quality resources out there. And so there's the Truth Initiative, which of course is for youth and young adults, but there's the, the government sites for texting, um, and then smokefree.gov. Uh, there's Freedom from Smoking from the American Lung Association. And then uh, I highly recommend that you check out our colleagues' um, site at the Smoking Cessation Leadership Center, which again is packed full of uh, training opportunities and evidence-based uh, resources. And uh, speaking for our team, that's, that, that's the, my last slide, but speaking for our team, I just wanna thank everyone for what you're doing. We're, we're really privileged to work with such dedicated and talented colleagues across the nation. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to 
uh, Jim and Amy to see if there's any uh, Q&A that we can get into. Hi, right, Chad, thanks, uh, that was great. Uh, and yeah, Lee sent in a question. Um, she says, um, and Lee, it, it is not a dumb question. It's a very good one. Uh, but Chad, if you wanted to answer this one, she says, uh, she asks, um, if, is, is, has anybody thought to prescribe uh, nicotine replacement therapy or vaping products to folks in the uh, shelters as a harm reduction protocol for smoking? Um, unfortunately, I don't, I don't know of anyone currently doing that. I mean, I think it's an excellent idea. I just don't know of anyone offhand. If there's anyone on the, on the phone that knows of any uh, model programs and you want to just uh, type that in, that would be wonderful. Yeah, and uh, just as an instruction for everybody else, I, I learned while, while Chad was talking that apparently I or somebody else has somehow managed to disable chat, so we'll have to look into how that happened. So you cannot chat to us for some reason, but you can use the Q&A icon if you're uh, scanning your screen. You're, you're, you should have a toolbar either at the, at the top of your screen or the bottom of the, your screen, depending on uh, how you're viewing us right now. And uh, there's a couple, looks like word bubbles, uh, and this says Q&A. So you can just uh, hit that icon and you'll see a little box open up and you can just type your questions directly in there to us, or you can uh, raise your hand. And if you raise your hand, uh, I'll, I will uh, allow you to, I will hit the uh, allow to talk button. And so Robert, uh, I'll spy, I don't know if you um, raised your hand uh, accidentally <laughs> or not, but I've unmuted your line if you had a question that you wanted to ask. Okay, so Robert may have raised his hand accidentally. That seems to be a thing that that happens. But we do have about uh, six or seven minutes left to um, uh, to answer any other questions that you may have. I know that Chad's going to be jumping off the line in a couple minutes here. Uh, so Amanda, uh, I, I think, is, is sort of following up on Chad's prompt to see if anybody else is... Uh, actively pursuing a nicotine replacement strategy during COVID. And Amanda says, we, uh, we in Maine are working with behavioral health residences within our health system uh, to work to provide uh, nicotine replacement therapy to residents in conjunction with some policy efforts and changes that despite all things COVID will still be going live on June 1st. I think that's fantastic, Amanda. And uh, if you wanted to um, write us offline and let us know uh, how that's going, I'd, be, I'd love to hear uh, more about those initiatives. Jim, as we're waiting for, for any last questions, I, again, I just want to reemphasize that uh, to everyone on the call that by Wednesday, we're going to have a landing page up um, that is a COVID and tobacco landing page. And we're just going to start putting resources there that we think might be uh, most salient for you. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And uh, maybe we can call this out. I know a lot of people who are on the line are calling in from or are attending from various public health uh, agencies. And so you're probably going to be getting just swamped with resources and um, we all can't <laughs> maintain our own resource pages or anything. But if you do see, if you run across something you think is really useful and you want to share with us at BHUBP and we can, we can put that there. And, uh, you know, to the extent that people do uh, wander across our website, maybe they'll, they'll they can gain access to that. So uh, send us whatever your finding is useful to you and uh, we'll try to get it out to our, our communities of practice and our partners at other places. Um, I'm trying to think there, I, I also want to say that this is something that we're obviously for, for obvious reasons, we're going to be following pretty closely. And as things change, as they become more certain or more clear, um, you know, we, we're going to uh, potentially put something else together in the future. So if you're, if you're starting to get questions that you think that uh, we here at BHWP might have some insights on, send those, our, uh, send those to us as well. Uh, because what people are curious about is what we want to be making comments on. So be, be, stay in contact with us. Use that email address that's on the screen right now uh, to, to let us know what you're running into, things that you have that you want to share and things that you don't know that you want to know about. Okay, well, no other questions coming in, no other hands. Oh, we have another hand, sorry. Uh, and there's a couple more questions too, Jim. Oh, I miss, oh, I see, I have to scroll down. Uh, that's my fault. So uh, this is Amy Dura. I I am about I have hit the unmute button on your line. 
Yeah, hi, this is Amy Dura. I work for the Healthcare Authority in Olympia, Washington, and um, your site has provided us with amazing training, and we are working with 17 sites um, together uh, across Washington State, the, uh, the opioid treatment networks, and mm -hmm. they are, the, one of the sites is a shelter in downtown Seattle, Washington, and they are, are providing opiate use disorder treatment and um, education and tobacco cessation. Um, so oh, cool. I, that's the only reason I'm, I'm raising my hand to let you know that there are <laughs> some shelters out there and um, they recommend and give it out to everyone who is interested, but the main barrier is um, access uh, yeah. to phone and the quit line. Excellent. Thank you very much, Amy. You're and uh, Tanya, too, has mentioned that uh, we hear the hospital UCH uh, has a tobacco and nicotine program for outpatient, inpatient, and cancer center patients. Tanya, if you want to, I know that that is true, but if you want to send us some materials for that, we'll make sure that uh, we're, we're, we'll continue spreading the word on, on your behalf there. Uh, and um, Carolyn and Alex have both asked where we can keep up with more uh, information about tobacco and COVID. And uh, I don't want to overpromise what we'll be able to do, but like I said, I'll be uh, keeping a really, really close eye on on that particular intersection. And so, if I see things that are of particular interest, uh, I will continue posting them on our uh, the landing page. And the landing page uh, that Chad keeps mentioning will be exactly where you are right now, uh, or the where you were a minute ago <laughs> when when you gained access to attend our meeting today. That same site where you. Uh, registered and then you got redirected to a page that said, um, you know, come back here to get a link and then you saw the link that changes that page is going to change and that's where the recorded webinar is going to live and that is also where we'll continue posting other resources as we find them and obviously for matters of copyright we can't put up every single study <laughs> that ever shows up uh, but if you're if you're reading something uh, as, as something shows up across you know you're reading the Washington Post or the Boston Globe and you're like what 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 study are they talking about what does that study really say send it to me I'll ask I'll, I'll answer that question if I can't post anything about it oh and this scrolling function oh yes great thank you Amy and all right, uh, so we have about a minute left if anybody has any final questions they want asked. Otherwise, we'll, we'll, we will sign off. Okay, great. Thanks again, everybody. Uh, send in your questions as you, as you think of them and you know where to find us. That's that email address right there to the right. And we will see or talk to uh, some of you uh, pretty shortly. Thanks again.